Welcome to the Draft Deeper Podcast. This is your host, Nathan Rubel. Joining me as always is my producer, Kevin Black, my co-host, Stephen Gillespie. And joining us this week, I kept telling the audience we were going to have some big time guests rolling in all throughout the month of April into May, hopefully throughout the rest of the draft cycle. That is definitely continuing tonight. Staff writer for The Athletic covering college basketball as well as the Kansas Jayhawks national champion. Kansas mm. Jayhawks, co-author of Beyond the Streak, behind-the-scenes look at Kansas' record-setting Big 12 title run, C.J. Moore. C.J., how you doing? Doing great. Got, happy to be on your show. Yeah, so I was talking to Steven. I was talking to my producer, Kevin, as well, that, C.J., I read your piece that you did on Ochai Abaji, and within five seconds of reading it, I'm like, I have to try and get this guy on a podcast because it was so phenomenally written. It's not just that we're going to talk about some guys who we're interested in for the draft because that's what this podcast is all about. But you did an excellent job just putting out details about Ochai's life, about Christian Brown's life, and just giving real backstories to these guys as human beings. It's not just all about what they do on the court. So I'm hoping that we're definitely going to be able to highlight some of those points today. But I'll lay it out there first and foremost. I warned CJ, who's going to get showered in praise on this podcast. If anyone does not subscribe to The Athletic and read this man's work, you you are legitimately doing yourself a disservice. I have been pleasantly um, surprised with everything that I've been reading at The Athletic first and foremost this year, but really CJ's work has been absolutely top-notch, and I am incredibly excited to dive into some of it today. Um, So as I said... We're going to break down some of the guys individually. Steven and I both have some questions that will alternate a little bit back and forth. But CJ, I'll just kind of start with a big picture point. Um, I think going into the season, a lot of people expected big things from this Kansas team. They expected them to contend not only in the Big 12, but honestly for a national championship loaded roster top to bottom with enough depth and and sure there were some there were some ups and downs for the team all year. But I think given the expectations the outcome shouldn't be as surprising to some people as it might have been um, when you're just going through the bracket. I know Arizona was a heavy favorite to go to the national championship game and contend for it, but it was Kansas who was in the game and it was Kansas who won. So just big picture, CJ, what are some of your takeaways from how the Kansas season was and then kind of your reaction as to them actually winning the championship? Uh, you know, I, I, I thought Kansas was going to be pretty good this year. I, I don't know that I would say I thought Kansas was going to be national champion good this year. Um, <laughs> even for most of the season, like I thought Kansas was a really good team. I thought Kansas was in the conversation, but um, they just, everything kind of came together at the end. Um, I think you had guys like David McCormick, Remy Martin playing better than they played <laughs> for most of the regular season. And then, you know, coming into the year, I didn't see the OGI elite coming. Um, I thought he'd, he'd improve gradually on, on what he'd done in the past. And he was a nice player as a junior. Um, but I, I didn't see his star taking off like it took off. Um, I thought Christian Brown would, would probably take a little mm-hmm. bit of a leap. Um, I, I don't know that I'm – I kind of saw the Christian Brown thing coming. I didn't see the Ochai thing coming to, to play the, at the level that, that he reached this year. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely get into to Christian Brown after Ochai. That, that is my guy. He's been my guy for the last two <laughs> draft cycles now, and I'm, I'm excited. Hopefully, um, he'll, he'll be entering his name into the draft, and I would expect to see him as a first-round pick. But let's start with, with Ochai. CJ, I don't, I don't want to waste too much time going into – um, just the surface level evaluation on him. Our, our audience has heard us talk about Ochai for the majority of the draft cycle now, but I mean, 39 games played, 39 games started, 35 minutes per game. So obviously taking on a huge role for that team on both ends of the floor, 19 points per game, 48% shooting from the field, 41% from three point range. We're talking about a guy who checks a lot of boxes for NBA teams. And I think that's a big reason why a lot of the guys at no ceilings have been so high on him and would deem him as like a back-end lottery type pick. But one thing I want to start with, CJ, and Steven's going to ask about Ochai's transformation into a leader a a little bit later on, but I want to start by asking you about his transformation into a basketball player 
who believes in himself. One of, one of the big things to take away from your piece about Ochai when you dug into some of the things that he did before the season to get ready for the season, it was it's about confidence. Um, is it common to see players come into a power program like Kansas from your experience unsure about their potential in, in the way that it was alluded to with Agbaji? Is that, is that common? No, I, I think he's a bit of an outlier in that he was a guy that really wasn't even a starter for his, his AU program. He, he didn't even, I mean, he, he played his last year uh, for MoCam, which is the big, big team here in Kansas city, the Nike team. Yeah. Uh, but he, he even, he didn't even make it a couple of years before that. So here, here's a guy that was, was always a good player in the area and, you know, was a good high school player, became a really, really good high school player his last year but he was never somebody that was in the rankings really high for most of his career. And I think that part of his life kind of always stayed with him. And it took some other people being like, man, like here, I'm, I'm, I, I trained Dane Lillard. Like I, I know what's good. You're, you can be elite. You can be really, really good. And I, I think that's, you know, what helped maybe co convince him to, um, that he could be something different than what he'd been in the past. And he, he had a really nice junior year at Kansas. Like he led him in scoring, um, you know, ha had a solid year, but that wasn't a great Kansas team. It was one of South's worst teams, which is, you know, speaks to the consistency he's had at Kansas where a three C could be one of your worst teams. But I, I think it took Ochai a, li a little convincing that like, Hey man, you, you can be an alpha dog. You can be a star uh, because he just had never been, I don't know if groom's the right word, but like that was never in nobody ever imagined that for him. Mm -hmm. What's kind of like your biggest takeaway with Ochai off the court? Because I think to achieve the results on the court that he has, th there are multiple things that we could probably say about him. Um, his, his smarts, his IQ for the game, his willingness to put in the work and get there. Then you dive into some of the physical traits to his game, but like, off the court, what do you think is the, the thing that stands out to you about Ochai the most after getting to know him a little bit, talk to some people around him? Well, you guys know this. NBA people are going to do their background work, and, and that's almost as important as what they see on the floor. Like I, I, think, Absolutely. I think NBA teams are, are valuing that side of it more and more every single year, and he's going to check every single box and like with a star because he's he's just a terrific terrific person um he comes from a terrific family like his mom and dad are just awesome people maybe the best parents like i've ever dealt with um on this side of of the job um sure. just not people who want their son um you know or are out there trying to get their son more pub or out there saying the coach needs to play the kid more when he was younger or anything like that like understood it was a journey they were both college basketball players at milwaukee and just just terrific people like people that, that care about others and and you know aren't going to inflate their son's ego or anything like that and and ochai is is just a very very humble guy not all about banging his chest like look at me type type dude at all and um i think that really played well with this kansas team and and like I think everyone saw, hey, I can't be a flashy look at me type guy because look at our leader, look at our best player, look at how he is. And so from a from a background side, I mean, he's he's not going to do anything to embarrass the team off the court. Um, just a very, very quality person that like they're going to want to throw out, who, whoever drafts him is going to want to throw out in the community and and let people <laughs> get to know that that guy because um, he's just a, just a really nice person. And I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And I think you definitely see some of those traits shine through in the type of role that he plays and has played for Kansas all year. And I think that will definitely translate and, and bode him well once he gets to the NBA, when he also will have to fit in around some pieces that are better than him, at least in his rookie and sophomore year, most likely. Um, what do you think Agbaji's story from his freshman year all the way through to his senior year says about not only him, but also coach self. And the reason why I asked that question is like to show the level of patience and trust to ultimately help instill that confidence in Ochai that he could become the player that he is today. Like th th there's a lot that you really need as a coach. You need to be patient with these guys and understand that 
not everybody's development is the same, right? His, his development has been pretty linear over the course of his career, but it's not something that happened overnight. So what do you think this whole story says about not only Ochai, but the environment that he was in at Kansas for four years? Yeah, I mean, I, everybody runs their own race. It's a cliche you'll hear again and again. And sure. um, I, I think, you know, he, he came in, obviously he, he was going to redshirt his first year. So they didn't think he was like going to blow the world away. <laughs> that that season and it became obvious about midway through that year like hey this guy's doing pretty well in practice we could use him and he really got off to a, a great start uh, as a freshman and, and a guy that even got a little bit of NBA draft pub then uh, just because you you saw the athleticism the shooting um, the, the you know his build like he, he's a guy I think pro scouts have have had their eye on for a long time yep. but it took him a little while to to be able to like turn into a score. He was just an athlete who could shoot a little and his shot got better and better and better. And then, you know, he and the, the last year he ended out of the, the handle and the being able to slash more, that kind of stuff. But I, I think what it says about self is, you know, he, he was, he didn't necessarily have to be patient and wait on him because he was always a guy that was a contributor to the program. Like he was, sure. he was starting throughout that time so I, I think it just speaks to Kansas has been a program where they haven't necessarily been like a one and done program. You right. take guys like Devonte Graham and Frank Mason and Thomas Robinson, like they fit a role. And then when it becomes your turn and you're, gro you're groomed to be the guy, right. But they're not necessarily trying to groom you for that right off the bat. It's just like, what role are you going to fit? this year what role are you going to fit next year and, and down the line and maybe eventually this guy will get to that and that that's why I think Kansas has done a good job of team building and figuring out hey uh you know saying the right things to guys and and, and when there's been stories like Ochai now and been stories like Devontae Graham yep it just makes guys want to work and see that hey this might be possible for me and that's that's where um, programs can just kind of take off because when you have that, like you're seeing that at Baylor right now, like absolutely the, the work that some of their players have done to really, really climb the ladder as far as um, becoming big time NBA players, right? You other guys see that and it just, it, the coaches don't have to tell them, Hey, you got to work, 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 work. Like it just becomes part of the culture. And, and I think Kansas has had that for a long time and, you know, in part, Ocha is a product of that. Don't have the level of success that Kansas has had over the years without a culture like that. And it's been very impressive to see sustained for such a long time. And it will definitely continue after guys like Ochai and, and, and Christian are gone from the program. Steven hop in here, man. You got some, you got some good questions lined up for CJ. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, I'm just enjoying just kind of sitting back and listening to CJ put us on game a little bit on just <laughs> more about what the Kansas program truly is and a little bit of insight as to, the, you know, the, the kind of the, the structure and the, the evolution of maturity that Coach Self is at, you know, demands from his players. And we even see it happen with guys who are, you know, like Oshai Baji, who are stars. So I, I'm enjoying just listening to this. But CJ, you, you talked about, you know, growing from a player who is assigned a specific role and then they are asked to basically be the unquestioned leader. And that's what it feels like Oshai Baji has definitely stepped into this season. And we see it on both sides of the ball. Rarely ever do you see a guy who is the leader of a team who does it on both ends of the floor. Like there's a couple of guys in this year's draft class that do that. I can think of a guy like Johnny Davis out of Wisconsin, but that list is very slim. And Oshai is right there at the top of, you know, players who do everything on the floor. And one thing that you chronicled, you know, in the role that he has uh, been asked to take on on both ends of the floor is something that a lot of us here at No Ceilings have fallen in love with about his play all season long. How much of that do you think had to do with his training that he received in the off season? You know, training guys like, you know, Phil Beckner, then ultimately he was able to get some insight from, you know, professional player Damian Lillard. How much of an impact did that play in his leadership role this season? Uh, I think that, that what Phil helped him with was his, his confidence and obviously some of the skill work with his, his handle and, and stuff like that. I, I, I think the leadership stuff came with some of that was with confidence. Hey, I can, I can be this, that guy. And, 
And some of it just became like a realization that, hey, I, I'm, I'm a, I can be the star of this team. It's time for my, me to use my voice. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, that, he, he, there's a moment in my story that I talk about where he's, he, he gets back to Kansas and he's meeting Bobby Pettiford for the first time. And he's, he's sitting next to Bobby and he just starts talking about, hey, I'm going to be this, 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 and this. If I'm not this, hold me accountable. And, and he was telling me the story and he's like, Bobby's probably like, this guy's crazy. Like, what's he talking about? You know? <laughs> but um, I, I, I think that, you know, o- o- Ochai is just, just, it's just a young man growing up and, and, yeah. and realizing that, that his voice matters and um, that, that will, you know, play well for him going forward. And um, he's just a guy that you're, you're, you're never going to have to worry about whether he's about the right things. Cause, cause he's going to be in. And yeah, he did a terrific job with this Kansas team and, and kind of kept them, um, you know, focused on the, on the right things as, as they went forward in their season and ultimately won a national championship. I, I think one of the biggest thing takeaways I had from the tournament for him was he, he wasn't shooting the ball well early in the tournament and, you know, teams were really trying to take him away. Yeah. But he had a couple of his best defensive performances during that time. Like, absolutely. absolutely. Bill, Bill yeah. Self always talks about, hey, you know, worry about the things you can control, effort and defense and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, the Providence game comes by. I think he had four blocks maybe in that game. Yeah, he was he was all over the place on that end of the floor. Yeah. So so even though he wasn't scoring like he had scored for much of the year, he was still having an impact and he wasn't pouting about it. He wasn't even mm-hmm. worried. You know, you'd ask him and be like, no, it's not a big deal. Like Coach Sell says, it's, it's going to happen for me. Like, it's, it's, it's fine. So I thought that was really cool to see. And then on the biggest of stages at the Final Four, like, you know, in the national semifinals, that he, he jumps up and makes a bunch of threes in a row. And, and uh, you know, a shot comes back around. So I, I thought that was, that was cool. And he, he had to work, like, I think mentally he had to work through some things late in the year where his shot – or he was putting so much pressure on himself like senior day. I think yeah. he wanted to have a great day and have a great moment. And, and he was putting so much self pressure on himself in the tournament that he wanted to have a great storybook run. Right. And like, I think by the end of it, he figured out just play and just yeah. let mm-hmm. things happen as they, as they do. And, and, and that was one thing that was cool to watch with him because I think he made some mental leaps there that'll help him once he gets in the NBA. Yeah, he didn't try to do too much at the end, right? He, he was letting every single shot come to him in spots that we know he's been knocking down shots from for years. Wasn't trying to force everything in his game that maybe NBA scouts would want to see more of. He was just playing to his strengths, and it paid off for the team in a, in a big way. Because he was, I mean, he was dominant from probably like the third game of the tournament in. Like, he was absolutely dominant. What a flamethrower. Lo- lo- love seeing everything he did. Yeah, and I mean, making multiple three-point shots in in opening halves. And even in the national championship game, I felt like he got a lot of mixed reviews on his performance, right? Because he didn't necessarily get a ton of help in that opening half, but he realized that guys were starting to kind of come on in the second half of the game. And I think that's where he received a lot of offensive criticism is because people were saying, well, he kind of took the foot off the gas. And I argued with several people whose opinion I respect and said, help was nowhere to be found in that first half. If it wasn't for Osha, they wouldn't have been in a position in the second half to, to make any sort of a run like they did. Yeah. He, I, I thought he played fine the first half and um, he got, off, got him off to a pretty good start. I mean, he made a couple good big shot or a couple shots there in the opening stands. I think that got him to that nine, three lead. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, yeah, I think he, she showed off plenty in the SA tournament and, and he he's not a guy that you're just going to have dribble down and, and go take a shot. Like they had to run stuff for him, but I think you saw the types of like pin down actions and, and oh, yeah. off, you know, curling to the basket and stuff like that. Like that was stuff he could never do in the past. So he showed through the tournament throughout the season, he showed his full, full arsenal of what he's capable of and what he can do. And he's never going to be a guy, I don't think in the NBA who you're going to go ask to average 30 a game, but he showed right. the types of things he can do in college that I think a lot of them will translate to the NBA. And um, so, yeah, for, for like, if anyone's questioning, Oh, he, he wasn't aggressive enough, yada, yada, yada. I, I think he was plenty ag- aggressive during that, that stretch. And what made Kansas so good was you, they could hit you 
with five different guys on a night, you know, yep. like that, that, that turn, that championship game was, which I kept, you know, got him off to a good start. Everybody was lousy in like the last 10 minutes, the, the first half. <laughs> yep. And then Christian Brown got him going in the second half. And then it was Remy Martin's turn. And then it was David McCormick's turn to finish it off. And Jay, with a little Jalen Wilson mixed in there and with a mm-hmm. little um, Dewan Harris defense mixed in. So I, um, I don't think that, uh, you know, criticizing Ochai for, you know, not putting up a better line in the SA tournament or in the championship game is, is kind of silly. Yeah, and I would agree with you. And you look, he was named most outstanding player in the tournament, also a member of the All-NCAA All-Tournament team, was a Big 12 player of the year and a consensus All-American, right? So that speaks volumes to his production all season long. And last question I have for you here, CJ, is that, with Ochai widely being believed to be a lottery pick this season, uh, I myself belong, I believe that he is going to be a lottery pick. Uh, we talked about Coach Self and how he has helped guys on the court in the college season. Uh, what is With the experienced coach like Coach Self, how does he try to prepare guys for that next level? And does it only involve, you know, on the court things? Or does he talk to these guys about how to conduct themselves as pros because of you know, previous success of former players. I'm sure he does. I mean, I, I think that the Kansas program is almost like in a way being a pro because there's so much attention to it. Yeah. Um, you know, that it's, it's a pretty high run organization. Like it's not just your um, it's, it's a big step up for them from high school and, you know, college is a big step up from pros, but I, but I do think there's so much attention around them and they have so many demands on them that, that it is a good, um, learning experience for them. I mean, they, they, they're, they're so if professional. It, they take their headshots in a full suit for crying out. If anything, they'll have less attention on them once they get to the NBA than they do at Kansas, just because of the, um, the obsession with, with that school and the, the fan base. But, um, no, I, 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 kind of forgot your question a little bit, but I, I don't know that he does anything special in terms of, of how to um, get them them ready. I think they just, the, the success speaks for itself with they've had guys that go into the pro ranks and, and, and do plenty well, especially those, those older guys um, like a Devante Graham, you know, not everybody's game translates like Frank Mason mm-hmm. was an awesome, awesome college player. Um, Thomas Robinson was an awesome college player, but like their skill sets did not, you know, those skill sets don't always translate to the NBA. I do think Ochai's should, you know, he's, he's like a prototypical three and D wing. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to dive into the next guy, Christian Brown. I talked about him at the top. Um, I, I do want to read off some more of his numbers to remind the audience of the type of prospect that I think he is. And I'm, I'm assuming CJ is going to agree with me. 14 points per game, six and a half rebounds, almost 50% from the field, 39% from three. Some people say that's a weakness. The percentages wouldn't say so. Um, 73% for the line, 83rd percentile in total offense, 86th percentile in total defense, ranks well on spot ups, handoffs, um, offensive rebounding, scoring out of the pick and roll, transition play is one of his biggest strengths. And the numbers check out as far as finishing around the basket and hitting on jump shots from different areas of the floor. Really, CJ strikes me as a more complete player than I think some people wanted to give him credit for. And like I said, I've been a fan of his, I mean, dating back to last draft cycle. I, I brought up the name then, Kevin Herter, because of how Herter for Maryland could handle the ball, make plays for others at his size, along with being able to stretch the floor and get to the basket and ultimately finish through contact. Um, you, you've been around the Kansas program. You've seen enough of Christian, not just in game, but also in, in practice settings. Do you think there's still more to his game to be unlocked that he hasn't been able to show even this year in Kansas and in some of his best moments? Do you think there's more there once he gets to the NBA? Uh, I don't know that that he hasn't been able to show much. I mean, I think this year what you saw out of him was he could do a lot more off the bounce yep. than he mm-hmm. had done in, in, in previous seasons. And um, I do think he's, he's pretty good at, at slashing the basket and, you know, he makes the goofiest finishes off goofy, you know, <laughs> euros and stuff like that. Like just, you, he makes shots that you, you just don't know how, like how did, how did he pull that off? And, was that the plan type thing. But um, I think that's what's maybe most exciting about his game is, is his ability to kind of make those, those goofy finishes 
Um, I do think his shooting could continue to get better. I, I think that his – they've made a big point of, like, trying to quicken his release. Yeah. Um, I, I do think he could do a, a better job of, of maybe getting it off a little quicker um, and, and having a little more confidence in it. Like, you look at that national championship game, the first – part of the problem the first half was – they were really sagging off Jalen Wilson and, and Christian Brown. Mm-hmm. And they weren't taking those shots. And then because they had that space, they were trying to drive the space, which is a fine strategy, but it was allowing the defense to just stay in good enough position to, to challenge them at the rim. And, and so that, I mean, that's, that really what came the first half was they couldn't rebound and, Jalen Wilson and Christian Brown weren't finishing their stuff and they weren't willing to take those three point shots. So um, I, I do think there's, there's some stuff with, with CB that he could continue to improve. You know, you guys are talking about like, it's a foregone conclusion that he'll, he'll leave this year. I don't know if that's the case. Um, I think that, and, and, and I, I still need to do some more reporting on this. I've kind of given Kansas their space. Like sure. <laughs> last couple weeks. they've earned it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but um, aggregators don't aggregate this in the words of Bill Simmons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, with, with, with Christian, like he, he comes from his dad's a doctor. So yeah. it's not like they're, they're in a hurry to, to go. And, and NIL is a thing now. And I think he's doing plenty well in, in NIL. Yep. Um, so, and he's seen the Ochai story. He's seen what's happened for Ochai. So it's possible that if he gets the feedback that, Hey, you're maybe late first, probably second round, something like that. He might decide, Hey, I want to come back and I want to try to be a lottery pick like Ochai. I mean, he's a guy with like a, not a big, I won't ego is the wrong word, but like, he's got confidence in himself. <laughs> so, so like if anybody's going to bet on themselves, like it's, it's Christian Brown. So, you know, I've throughout the season, I kind of had the assumption that he would come back now winning the, the national championship could change that calculus. Right. Like, sure. Hey, what else can I do? I just won a national championship, right. you know? Um, but I, I think it's possible that, that he, he actually comes back to school. And um, if he does, you know, some of the things you'll want to see is like, can you uh, improve on, the quickness of your release. Can you show that like you're more willing to take those shots? Um, will will self put him in some of the pin down type actions that he put Ochai in? And you know, can he show his ability to do that? Like I think he was good at attacking a closeout and attacking in transition, but can he maybe add some, you know, the, like the national championship game? They post him up a couple of times because Caleb uh Love was ankle was hurt. So they were just basically trying to take a pick on him. Yeah. But, like, yeah, can he maybe do some, some things like that? I mean, he's he is a legit – though, this is a 6'7", I think, right? Yeah. So yeah. 6'6", six, 6'7", six, 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 yep. Yeah. He's, he's, a, like, he's not a 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, who's actually 6'4". He is legit, has, you know, that size. He, I, every bit I, of I, it. I, every bit of – he's at least 6'6". Six, six, he might be 6'7". So, um, that's what makes him so intriguing because you've got the skill level there – and um, you, you just don't find many guys at that size with that kind of skill and that can move as well as he can. And I think that's where the, the NBA intrigue is. But I, I do think there's things that he can continue to improve on if he decides to go back to school. Um, but I can't blame the guy if, you know, he, he wants to go play in the NBA and um, especially if he's going to be a first round pick. I would agree wholeheartedly. I mean, the only, the, the main reason why I asked the question is because a friend of the program and fellow writer at the athletic for you, Sam Vecini. I mean, he'd say, Sam's whole mantra is like, he sees all the things he can do in transition, but he's not sure how effective he is offensively in the half court. Mm-hmm. I have disagreed with him. I think that he, there actually is a little more kind of some of the things that you were talking about CJ to his offensive game in the half court. Uh, it's interesting. Can, is there enough that he can show coming back? to raise his stock significantly. I think I would say yes. I think there's a number of people who would probably disagree with that sentiment. So it will be interesting to see how at least that part of it plays out. I I think the the thing for me that I'd want to see out of him, it it, it sounds weird to say this about him knowing like the story I've written and, and everybody's seen, you know, him yelling and, but like, can he be a guy who's confident in his abilities all the time? Because yep. like that national championship game is an example, like he was hesitant to pull the trigger. Um, him and Jalen Wilson were going to the paint with kind of some some hesitancy, right? Like 
um, maybe taking that next step confidence wise um, would be a big thing for him. And then, yeah, doing a little bit more in the, in the half court and scoring in the half court. But I, I do think he's capable of scoring in the half court. I think he's good at attacking and close out those kinds of things. I mean, he's not going to be a guy that they're going to be running like a ton of half court stuff for in the NBA. Mm-hmm. It's probably going to be, you know, spotting up, talking to close out, getting out in transition, those kinds of things, which is, is where he really excels. Yeah, so Nathan, just real quick, um, yeah. I'm gonna I want to go ahead and ask one of my questions now because I feel like it ties in pretty closely to the to the you know train that we're on right now. Uh, you know, CJ, you you mentioned in your article, it's entitled "Rock Talk Jayhawk." Uh, Chris, uh, Kansas's Christian Brown, or excuse me, Brown backs up his swagger with star level production. Uh, you mentioned that Coach Self had said that he wished Brown would look for his shot a little bit more. Uh, I feel like me as an evaluator, that's something that I tend to agree with. And and there are others that feel that way too. Um, It feels like a lot of the stuff is predetermined and it's usually started with like maybe a jab step to the right and then a dribble to his left. And he's looking to either pass the ball or drive right there. Has coach, has coach ever really mentioned like what he meant by like looking for his shot more? Is there like a certain uh, style of shot that he wants him to be a little bit more um, aggressive with or is it just a shot diet in general just like being being more open to pull the trigger a little bit quickly I, I think he thinks he turns down too many threes okay I think he, he wants them to, to, to be well I think he thinks the way he can make it in the NBA is hey you got to be a knockdown shooter and you got to believe in that shot and be willing to pull that trigger and I, I think there's there's too many times where he runs off shots that where um you know, he could, he, he has the space to, to pull the trigger. And that's, that's what I think he, he wants out of him is to be a, a willing uh, shooter, like all the time. Like if you, if you've got the space, just like Ochai, that, that's what Ochai became this year, right? Like yeah. Yeah. if he had the space, he was going to pull that thing. And, and I think that's what he wants to see out of CB. Okay. So I know, I know everyone wants to talk about the fire that he plays with. And the fun was, part. The, the displayed yeah. on the court. I, I think Steven's going to, touch on more of that but I, I want to talk about it in a different way for CJ what I want to ask you about is he, he shows a lot of that right like some of the some of that anger that fire that aggression um, he shows that yet he still seems to have um, composure and mm-hmm. he keeps himself a good demeanor in the right moments yeah. right he seems to have great relationships with his teammates with his coaches you touched on this a little bit in your solo piece on Brown but in your opinion, what has helped him off the court and keeping his demeanor in, in the right moments and still being a coachable player despite all that fire you, you don't always see that. Some some guys are just so aggressive and they're a little overconfident and cocky and that they, they don't take to coaching sometimes really well. But it seems like from what I've been able to observe, Christian is a very coachable kid. Yeah, I, I think that he is um, – I don't want to say it's for show – but like, it's, it's just like, he likes to, he, he enjoys doing that kind of stuff, but it's not like those emotions take him to a bad place. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. he, he's, he's not a guy who is just like, you don't know which way he's going to go. <laughs> okay, you know, like Jekyll and Hyde style. Yeah. 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 It, it's, it's all healthy. Like, um, you know, he, he just, he, he likes being fire. He likes showing, like self calls it, he, he likes guys to show personality and that's him showing his personality. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think there's any concerns with like, this guy is just going to be off his rocker today. Um, he, he just enjoys talking a little trash, yelling at people. And it, it probably comes from like, he was the little dude a lot of his life. Like he mm-hmm. wasn't always six, seven. He was, I think I have it in my story. I think he was five, nine as a freshman, maybe in high school. Um, like Dewan Harris used to be taller than him. <laughs> so he, he was a late bloomer who always kind of had a chip on his shoulder like I can hang with these dudes type thing right like so I think we're, that's where some of that comes from but no I don't, I don't think any of it's going to be like oh man he needs to be able to control his emotions it's not like when Grace and Allen couldn't help but yeah. guys right yeah like, that there's, was yeah there, there's none of that with with Christian Brown all right yeah and I have a question just kind of kind of piggybacking off of Nathan here you know I say that he has a little bit of clap back in his game where it's not like anything that he's just going out of his way to like be mean or anything like that. But it, it appears that he does pay attention to what people have to say. And uh, he doesn't mind, he doesn't mind kind of like giving it right back, you know, from, 
profanity riddled exchanges from people on the sideline or even tweets that were directly addressing some of the naysayers that he's had interactions with. Right. So um, how much of his personality, you know, and again, I I don't want to, I don't want to steer it in a way that's making it sound like I'm being critical of him. I, I think that his teammates love it. Right. It looks like he, for everything that Oshai Baji is as a player where we're talking about, you know, he's, he's the sweetheart on the team. He's kind of like the example. He feels like he doesn't have to kind of outwardly express how he's doing. I think a large part of that has to do with, he has a Christian, he has a Christian Brown that can kind of help him out on the team and do that for him. He's got a guy that can kind of rally the troops a little bit. So um, have you seen that like firsthand, like how Christian Brown has like impacted the team because of his, his fiery personality and then how much of his game do you think do you think that that's a big part of his game that he has to do that to kind of play himself into a game or do you is it more along with what you just said earlier that it's just fun for him I think when he starts doing that kind of stuff like he gets like the confidence thing we went to earlier like he's like all right I am a bad boy like I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't do these kinds of things um but none of it's like per none of it's some guys are like that, the, the clap you said, like they, they, okay, you made a shot. I got to go make a shot on you. There, there's not necessarily that like one upmanship with him. I think it's more of like, um, it's, it's team type stuff. Like I was just watching, I rewatched the championship game um, over the last couple of days. And uh, I, I noticed on the podium or on the, you know, stage afterwards, like him, him and Jalen Wilson counting like how many rings is that one two, three, <laughs> four. like like it's just that kind of stuff like after um I think after they beat Miami like he was pointing at his ring thing you know like yeah he just I think he he enjoys kind of doing that kind of stuff but um, it feels like team building you know like that's yeah, what it feels yeah. like yeah he, he just gives them a little bit of he gives his guys a little bit of swagger by doing yeah. that kind of stuff but it's it's not the oh this guy just scored on me I gotta go score on him type thing I understand so the last two guys that we're gonna touch on I, I say last two I, I might sneak in a little bit of a Remy Martin question at the very end but I know <laughs> I know I know Stephen wanted to ask you about David McCormick and, and Jalen Wilson so I'll let him run, run with these two guys yeah and I just got a question a piece for these guys we don't got to go through like a super in-depth breakdown or anything but one thing that you wrote about David McCormick in particular, I wanted to, to ask you on. I feel like it would be, uh, you know, bad of us not to. So you wrote about how Coach Self gave McCormick the net after the championship game. And you wrote about how Coach had always believed in David in spite of the criticism that kind of came from maybe some skeptics outside the program or, or maybe people inside the program. I'm not necessarily privy to that information. But um, what about McCormick? Was it necessarily his role? or, you know, his overall game did people have a hard time with prior to obviously culminating into a championship between, you know, Coach Self's belief in, in McCormick? Well, the biggest mistake he ever made was following Yudoka Azabuke. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that was his problem. You know, David's not a, a, a big vertical threat at the rim. Yeah. Um, it was great. He was able to get that lob to finish, um, to start the comeback in that second half, the first play they played, they ran that elbow get play. Um, right off right off the bat to start the second half but he he wasn't a guy that was able to jump up and, and dunk a lot like that's what you could do um he would struggle at times finishing around the basket and he's just kind of he moves funny and um so you know mostly it was just fans being frustrated with like for instance the play kansas ran to win the game uh to, to put them up three they run that play a lot and they would run that play a lot in late in games this year. And fans were like, why are they going to McCormick when they could go, <laughs> they could go to Ochai or, or CB or Jalen. You know, they have like, these shooters on their team yeah, that they like, could give like, the ball to. Yeah. Why are they running that play then? So um, I, I, I think that's where some of that came from. And then, you know, defensively he had his issues at times. Um, and it, it, you know, I think Bill Self was, was probably critical of him inside their walls um, for that kind of stuff and and I know his finishing would frustrate self at times but um, when it came down to it at the end like he, he finished pretty well and the, the great thing about David McCormick was like even when he was he was going through his stuff where he wasn't finishing at best at times this year and big 12 play he did pretty well but mm-hmm. he he, all, he he found his niche offensive rebounding 
and getting to the free throw line and making free throws. And so that made him just doing those two things, like that made him an effective, efficient offensive player. And um, then when he was able to move his foot, knee, like they were all kind of yelling at him all year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I do think he felt better in the tournament and, and you saw that he, he could play a little bit better. Now, if you want to talk about his NBA um, potential, like I don't know that he fits in that, that game very much just right. because, um, you know, the way to attack Kansas was to put him in a middle ball screen and, and you know, um, just watching today, like Caleb Love was just able to scoot right by him and um, he got better guarding ball screens and he got better moving his feet um, the last couple of years. But I, I think that it, it, it will be hard for him to, to like make it in the NBA, but he can still make a lot of money playing this game, um, you know, overseas or, or, or he might even hang around he might hang around as a two-way guy for a little bit or something like that. But I, I don't see him necessarily like, obviously, you know, nobody's putting him in, in mock drafts right now. Sure. Um, sure. He's, he's, he's up against it, probably making an NBA, but you know, maybe he has a chance if, if, if he can get his um, knee and his foot right. And um, you know, he starts moving a little better, but um, as far as college players go, like he, he turned out to be a really, really, really good college big man. And I even wrote a, during his junior year, his first two years, like I did not like him as a college prospect. Like I just, I just, I didn't see it with him. And um, his junior year during Big Twelve play, like he was playing outstanding, and he was really he was KU's go to guy during yeah. Big Twelve play last year. Even though Ochai ended up leading him in scoring, like David McCormick was their go to guy in the second half of the year. And uh, I, I wrote like an apology letter basically at the athletic, like, Hey, sorry, I was critical of you. I didn't think it could be these things, but Hey, you're doing great. So um, he, he has been known to, to prove people wrong in the past, but I would be surprised if like, he's, he's a guy that plays the NBA for a long time. Now, if he comes around in the 1990s, probably does. But yeah. it's, just, it's just hard <laughs> for, for guys like Dave McCormick to, to make it in the league. Um, you've got to be pretty elite athletically to do that. I, I got to sneak in one quick yeah. question about him. Were, were you surprised during the tournament run of just how good his touch was offensively? Like he was hitting some ridiculous shots. We won a game so with the touch. Yeah. Some, of, yeah. some of those turnarounds, I'm like, there's no way this is going in. And then it was like a swish through the rim. He was making free throws left and right. And like big free throws. Like did, did that stuff surprise you? Like how much he was able to step up offensively? Not really. I mean, the free throw shooting, if anything, I bet his free throw percentage was lower in the tournament than it had been during Big 12 play. Um, so, he, you know, he's always been a really good free throw shooter. No, he, he just he's a guy that, that it looks awkward, but he can make some tough hooks <laughs> like he, he really can. And, and um, so, no, I, I wasn't surprised by those those finishes. Um, sometimes he has some really ugly ones that don't go in. But um, sometimes, you know, if, if, if he gets his shoulder square and he jumps up there and, and shoots that jump hook, he's, he's usually pretty good at, at it. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I think that one thing that Nathan and I would, would say to you here, CJ, is that just because a player doesn't make it in the NBA, like we're not the type of uh, show to be like, oh, well, he's just not a good player. Like it, it's really hard to make it the pros and even mm -hmm. even professional players overseas, like we have the utmost respect for here on the show. So if, if that's the path that McCormick, you know, is, is afforded to go down, then that's still a success, you know, considering, you know, where he was when he came to KU and where, and where he is, you know, going to be leaving. So uh, last player that I want to ask you about, Nathan might have a question or, or two about Remy Martin was Jalen Wilson. Now, you know, he's had games where it seems like he's kind of figured it out and put it all together. But then on the other hand, you know, there was times where he didn't necessarily feel like a, a major contributor. So I want to ask you, you, you spoke on McCormick's professional prospects. How do you feel about Wilson's? You know, do you think that it's simply a matter of playing behind McCormick and Agbaji and Brown to where there were those moments that he just kind of felt left out? Or do you just think that, you know, his play style has something to do with it? Like, do, do you think that he could be a better player, obviously, with like a, a larger role afforded to him? Yeah, I think he's, you know, you got him. He's still got, I mean, technically, yes three years of eligibility yeah. left yeah thanks to COVID uh, right yeah <laughs> yeah but but he's he's um and he he redshirted his first year so he's he's going to be a fourth year player next season assuming he comes back um I think the, the the things that he needs to show continue to to be more uh proficient with his his jump shot 
And um, he really struggled shooting it early in the year, but got better. And his story was, you know, his, his season and his arc, my dog might start barking because she's, <laughs> she's, she's hungry. All good. Um, this is a dog friendly podcast. So. Yes, yeah, she, 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 she gets, likes to get on all of them. Um, the, the thing with him, I mean, he got a DUI right before the season and uh, that ended up putting him out of the starting lineup once because he, he was suspended for three games. They were starting Dewan and, and Remy. And so it, I think it was tough for him when he came back, he was trying to show, okay, I had this off season. This is what I want to be. And he was trying to show the things that he can do. And it took him a little while to just kind of blend in again. And, and, and actually Remy Martin getting hurt was like the best thing for him because it allowed him to be a starter. He knew what his role was going to be. He knew he was going to play plenty of minutes to, to get his shots and get his points and stuff like that. Um, but no, with, with, with him and him becoming a pro, I think he just needs to become a better shooter and just continue with his becoming a little bit better athlete, like just doing, doing things to get a little bit quicker, but he is a powerful dude and he's really good in the open court. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, if he can just become just a tad bit more explosive year in and year out, he's got good size, he's got good skill. Um, I, I'm not sure he's quite there yet, but I, I think, you know, he has the potential to get there and I think he'd he'd do himself a favor to, to come back to school. Just yeah. I love one. him as a rebounder and defender. Absolutely. I was oh, say just- the, 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 actually his defense could get better. Like there were teams that, that picked on him. Uh, Miami, for instance, like Cameron McGusty was just going at him again and again in that first half. Um, well, McGusty's pretty good too. McGusty's pretty damn good. <laughs> McGusty's pretty damn good. But I, I do think on the ball defense, um, just defense in general, he could he could make some strides there, and and that's the that's the kind of stuff that will get make him a good enough player in the NBA. Like he's going to have to guard, be able to guard his position. Yeah, so, with that size, absolutely. Yeah, so those are those are things he just needs to continue to get better at. But again, he's he's only played two years of college basketball. Like he can continue to get better at those things, and um, you know maybe here in a year or two we'll be talking about him as a first round prospect. There you go. Just a fun one to, to cap off this podcast episode, then we'll close it out. But re- regarding Remy Martin, CJ, just how satisfying was it for, for everyone around the program? You can even say you're, yourself included covering the team to see him have some really bright moments during the tournament. I mean, he's had, he's had a really rough last two years. And I mean, he was somebody who was being looked at as an NBA prospect before he left Arizona state. So just to kind of see the, the ups and the downs, but ultimately he's, he's really capping it off with a bright spot. How satisfying do you think that was for everybody? I, I think it was exciting for them. You know, I, I think I'm sure the Remy Martin experience was frustrating at times. <laughs> um, he as as Bill self said, um, I think he told the team afterwards, like you kept saying that, in March, we'd all see like you were going to come around in March, and and boy, did you come around! Like <laughs> microwave. Uh, yeah, he was he was a microwave. He did some things that frustrated itself, I think, and in, in the way that he played, and um, some habits that didn't maybe translate to Kansas basketball. But um, man, that the the dude is a bucket. Like when when he gets rolling, he he gets rolling and um, makes some just weird, awkward shots. But but, <laughs> but when they start going in, they go in and. Um, he's got some bursts that was definitely missing when his knee was hurting. So, um, yeah, I think it was the Remy Martin experience was all worth it by the way that he played down the stretch and in, in, in that second half of that championship game, because they probably don't win a national championship uh, without him. Well, CJ, I can't thank you enough for the time that you gave us today. My, my audience, if they're keen listeners to the pod, they would have noticed that we didn't do a national championship game. Uh, breakdown because I, I definitely knew that, that we were going to have you on, on the pod soon enough. I did not expect to be having you on after Kansas won the national championship, but everything, <laughs> everything just kind of worked out. Right. So we, we definitely thank you for taking the time to sit down with us and, and give us some insight into not just what goes on on the court with these guys, but also off the court, all of that stuff's important, especially for NBA scouts and, and talent evaluators. So just, one time for my audience, CJ, if you could just tell everybody where they can find you on social media and how they can consume all the work that you're doing. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at CJ Moore Hoops and all my works at The Athletic. So please sub- s- click on one of my, if you're not a subscriber, click on one of my stories and hit subscribe so I get the credit. And, <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you'd be happy if, if, you, if you're not a subscriber. Um, 
come on, what are you, what are you waiting on? Like we, 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 we cover it all, not just college basketball, but NBA, uh, all sports. So, um, it's, it's, it's a good bang for the buck. I, I, I like to think so. Uh, and y'all run some pretty good thing. deals too, for, you know, new, new, um, subscribers and things like that for the most part as well. Yeah. I believe it's a, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's still a dollar uh, a month right now for, for new subscribers. So uh, that's, that's a pretty good, good deal there. Yeah. And it's not, it's not just CJ covering the college beat as well. I mean, Kyle Tucker does a great job with the Kentucky beat. Dane O'Neill is a really strong national college basketball writer. Sam Bassini as a friend of the pod is doing all the draft stuff and some NBA stuff. So yeah, CJ said, you're getting a lot with an athletic premium content. Yeah. Quite, quite literally. So definitely make sure you subscribe to the athletic. I am. And Steven is. So that means you guys, you guys should all subscribe too. but Steven, go ahead, do your thing, man. Plug yourself for the audience. Well, yeah, first off, just CJ, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time today. I learned a lot. I know that Nathan did too, and I'm sure the listeners did as well. So just thank you for, you know, being available to us, uh, coming and talking to us about your insight that you're afforded to, to KU. It helped all of us be, be a little bit smarter today. So thank you with that. Um, for people who want to follow me, you can do so on Twitter is where I'm most active at Stephen G Hoops. That's Stephen with the PHG Hoops. Uh, you can read my written work at noceilingsnba.com. I got a piece coming out about a different player than what I teased about earlier in the week because of players declaring and, and all that fun stuff. So I'm not going to tease anybody today. The lesson learned with that. And then um, <laughs> you can follow No Ceilings NBA on Twitter as well at No Ceilings NBA and No Ceilings TV on YouTube. And definitely make sure you're following me on Twitter at Draft Deeper. Make sure you subscribe to the Draft Deeper podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. Stay tuned. Plenty more fun podcasts coming. We got Matt, Matt Penny and Matt Babcock coming on next week. So big April will keep rolling. But until then, thank you all for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week.